I'm a recovering CISO. Okay. So I've, done, <laughs> I've done basically all of the jobs in the you know in the executive suite for better or for worse. And I've been at you know a lot of companies, some for a short period of time, some so much for longer. And you know, some of the things that we talked about here, the, the sort of flavor of the day when it comes to talking about the board of directors and your cyber insurers is a state called cyber resiliency. So I'm going to give you a little bit of my take on cyber resiliency and sort of how this fits in with you. And hopefully by the end of this conversation, you guys will understand not just sort of like the CISO rule, that's all great, but this isn't really about the CISO rule. This is about what the CISO rule cares about, what matters to the business, and how we want to know. So without further ado, um, does everybody know what cyber resiliency is? Straight off of the rip from NIST, okay? This is basically the CSF, right? The same thing, right? It's the ability to just make your standard recover from something bad, in essence. Sounds great, but it's also something that's really tied to business initiatives. First part, that's pretty technical in nature. The second part, it gets a little bit more nebulous, right? Every business is different. Every threat model is different. There's an awful lot of design principles to consider when you're talking about it. The intent of my conversation up here is not to walk you through all of this stuff. This is just, hey, okay, but to be complete, there's a background here in education that requires the conversation of some of the things the business has to adhere to in order to truly understand the risk framework and make risk management decisions. It turns out things that we've been doing for an awful long time fall into now what's called cyber resiliency training. Okay. Do you guys remember disaster recovery on the tape? Okay, now we understand this 3 one principle of making sure you have three availability zones, two regions, one offsite someplace for cloud, and you know, so on and so forth. But so the game really hasn't changed too much. These strategic design principles are really about how do I take and build the structure of an organization and security program so that it can be effective, it can be measured. It can be a metric. This should also look familiar to you. Maybe not in this particular example, but if you look through each of these structural design principles, you're going to say, huh, yeah, with that response, I get that line. I know what that relates to. And I put this in here specifically for winger because <coughs> yesterday we're talking about CISOs that don't understand how risk works. The CISO doesn't understand how risk works. The rest of the organization is going to understand how risk works. If you don't understand how risk works, <clears throat> we have a different conversation. The executive team has a different conversation. They're uninformed appropriately. We don't really understand how risk relates to the business, and we also can't put something on the risk register that says, hey, uh, yeah, we know we do this, right? And we don't really have a plan to fix it, but this is a risk we've accepted or this is a risk that we're going to have to deal with, or this is a vendor risk, or I just got here, and before I get screwed as a CISO, I'm going to get a zero dollar retainer with a breach response company, and I'm going to lay down all the residual risk today, right? To make sure everybody knows what that means. Are you guys familiar with the term BAU? Your whole job Right, running a security program is to not end up with the newspapers. That's what we think. But the business thinks this is all about making sure you maintain business as usual. So the concerns we have about that is what is business as usual? How do we quantify that? If somebody says, hey, uh, you know, we transact a billion dollars worth of you know, financial from this company to this company, I'm a payment processor, I'm a broker, I'm a transactor. Business as usual is a pretty substantive thing. If you run an ice cream shop, business as usual is keeping the doors open. Now, yes, sir. So the context of what business as usual means is different. It's important to keep it clear in your minds when you think about those design concerns for what resiliency is. Sounds great. As Mike Tyson says, everybody's got a plan, so I punch them in the face. <laughs> the 
challenge we have isn't whether or not we design things appropriately. We follow the resiliency framework, right? I've got a maturity model, I've got spreadsheets. Things get real. Things are real. And some of the challenges, again, from a CISO perspective, when I brief the board, I have a set of regular metrics that I go through. It's never a good idea to surprise the board. When we talk about cyber resiliency, right, and the connotation around that is, again, business as usual. That means everything that I say to the board is not business as usual. If it's an interruption, if it's a metric that doesn't look right, all of it. When we think about this in the context of today's environment, you've got the Cybersecurity Review Board only investigating Microsoft, right? You've got some compromises that have scaled out to 75, 80 million people. You've got an unknown level of depth of foreign compromise of Microsoft credentials, keys, certificates, and maybe a lot of other things. And we won't know the grounds and depths of that for years. We also know that it's a relatively recent proposal to suggest that zero days are now used for ransomware, right? Last year, $1.1 billion in payout for ransomware. So I'm going to keep going back to this thing called business as usual. Isn't this usual? Feels like it. Look at the trend of the last, you know, look at 2023. Last year, in the first nine months of the year, we already passed the number of cyber attacks ever did. From a trend perspective, that doesn't really sound terrific to me as a CISO. And notice in here, right, this ominous warning to CISOs, right? I'm going to talk a little about this throughout this talk, not just because uh, it's something I'm very close to. Um, at least one of the two CISOs that have been indicted uh, are good friends, and they know what they're doing. But also because the importance of what it means when you have a conversation, again, about cyber resiliency. What does that mean to the board? What does it mean to the executive staff? What does it mean to the investors? Everybody knows this, okay? One of the metrics the board doesn't get is the metric that I give to the executive team. Right, how are we doing on vulnerabilities? Do you really want to know that answer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got 100,000 vulnerabilities. Shock and awe, okay. How many of those are critical? Well, I mean, less than 5,000. So, I mean, you know, statistically, that's pretty good. And, okay, cool, what's the trend on that? What is the impact those vulnerabilities have? What are, okay, those things matter. Those things help you understand business as usual, right? Those things might interrupt my $1 billion transaction at the profile. And so I, I do care. The executive team does care. Their teams, the risk owners, right, do care. challenge we have is understanding which ones are the ones that matter. Oh, it's critical, and according to him, right? Sneak says this, cool. Cisco says that, well, let's say Palo Alto says that for now. <laughs> and then you've got Cisco who has an opinion about no commonly exploited vulnerabilities, or no exploited vulnerabilities, sorry. So when you think about that as, it's what we know, Right? Adversaries have their own opinions, then we probably don't have CVs for all things, right? That they have fully weaponized, right? Quick aside. What does that mean to us? This is usual in the security industry. Well, there's a little bit of yelling into the void. You know that. There's a, hey, this thing came out, are we ready? Somebody tell somebody about it, right? I'm actually not one of those CISOs that calls my guys and says, hey, so uh, we'll type them, so how are we doing? But at the same time, sort of the context around all of that is, 
if the business saw what actually happens in a lot of cases behind the scenes when some real thing happens here, right? This is sort of the conduit by which this entire industry is run, right? And yes, there's a little hyperbole here. This, this is a lot of focus that happens in incident response. Uh, just a quick show of hands. How many people have been in an incident that lasts longer than 24 hours? It's just like riding a motorcycle. Just because you haven't been down doesn't mean you won't be. <coughs> that kind of a situation is a regular operating procedure that most of the large places that I've been in. And the challenge there is how many times a week, how many times a month, how many are you? How do you contend with that? So, you know, part of this is well, this is the usual is me briefing the executive team and probably being involved in incident response and briefing the executive team in this capacity as well. Most of the time, that level of folks not getting up on Saturday, not two in the morning on a Friday, right? And so that level of understanding of what business as usual is, <coughs> is very skewed. Someone would ask, well, who actually owns this problem, cyber resiliency? And uh, this is a little bit pointed. I don't want you to take away from this that this is the way that it is everywhere. Okay, but I always think about something as, you know, there's a plan, there's a strategy, there's a theory, and there's what actually happens. A lot of cases, what we talk about here is mature companies follow CMMC, they have governance risk and compliance frameworks, they have an organization that brokers the risk to the organization itself. They have owners of those risks. Those risks are tied to risk to the business. The VP of engineering, right, owns the risk of those vulnerabilities, for example, or SCP of engineering, depending on, you know, where you are, what you're doing. HR owns those risks for Personnel, not the CISO. Contracts, contractual risk, not owned by the CISO, even if you do a third party audit. Who's that owned by? Legal. There you go. That legal risk is something that you're going to help validate, but you don't own that risk. Okay, that man sounds good. But the truth of that is, if you have a vendor that's been compromised and you did the vendor due diligence on that, who do they come and talk to? Yeah, CISO. Why is it different? Everybody knows what a CIO's role is. It's been defined for a long time. CISO's not a new role, but it is a utility player. And the challenge with that is, it's not just the CISO, but the security program. Everybody involved with that program also has to know how does the mail work? How do we ship software? Yes, I do as a response. That's my primary go to thing. How does the business make its money? How long does it take for these transactions to only process? We know that's normal behavior. What partners actually deal with all of our revenue so we can assess those guys on a regular basis? They got to know the entire business. First three things that you set up when you go to a company show me the flow of every piece of data here, give me an access control matrix. And then show me what logs we have and don't have, right? And then I'm calling a zero dollar breach response container immediately following, right? You have to know the whole thing. So when we think about what does it mean when we say who owns cyber resiliency, obviously that's a business problem. Obviously that's the conversation you have with the board. Not all CISOs brief the board. And not all CISOs have full autonomy to make sure cyber resiliency is, in fact, in place. You might own the risk. Okay? <laughs> Let the statistics soak in. Okay? Most of these companies. Fortune 500 has some of the best security programs in the world. Security programs in the world. A large shoe manufacturer in Portland has 198 guys, people, 
working on this problem. We've got research, we've got response, security operations, reversing. They've got an entire suite of folks doing this work. There's nobody on the shoe manufacturer in Oregon's board that would reflect the same level of understanding of that problem. Why? Business as usual. How much of a transactional basis can that possibly affect? Oh, if I can't launch a shoe, that's a thing. If I can't launch a shoe because of a cyber attack, okay, from a second. So some things to think about. That zombie dude probably will see some. <laughs> and that's also a, a parable for down the food chain, right? Because the rest of the team is probably feeling some of that. <coughs> Here, shake his hand, that, that could be the chief revenue officer, right? It's a new suit, looks good. <laughs> <laughs> zombie guy slept in this, and that's how it is. And so it's really important to understand that. One of the things that goes along with this, it's not just, you know, the difference in the roles and the difference in the impact and the understanding of resiliency. It is also what happens when you take that mantle, right? What does that mean to you? What does it mean to the family? All of these other types of things. Your lifestyle is different. Your burn is different. All these other things. Why am I saying all this? You guys know this already. How many of you guys plan to be in this career for five years? How many from 10? If this is your career, how about 20? Okay, so from the other side of that thing, now is different than it once was. Being able to maintain this, if you look at that veracity and velocity of the types of threats we're facing today, and you think about what the requirements are, Resiliency, you know, it's not like when we grew up, we were joking about this on the way over here. It's not like when we grew up, mm -hmm. sorry, Gen X, that's where we're at. Uh, it's not like when we grew up, you didn't have seatbelts in the car. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or you got in the back of the car and you walked around to whatever that horse, that was part of the fun of it. Right now, it's like the cars are less safe, right? They're not made of steel, and maybe it's some idiocy that happens around that too, but the cars are less safe, the cars are a little bit sharper. Every turn you make has a much different set of consequences than it once did. It's not the same thing. It doesn't mean that looking at 500 megs of traffic capture in 1998 wasn't the coolest thing there ever was. 500 megs today? Yeah. yeah. Sure. My phone does that, right? No big deal. And it also runs for him and analyzes it for me and tells me the app. Right? I might be winning. When you think about this, a lot of these same questions that we're asked to do from a resilience perspective should be part of the practice we've been doing for 20 years, right? If you're screaming into the void. So I think about this when you take those standards and you bring that into the context of having done this for a long time and know what this problem is, and they probably have a program that addresses this. These are recent statistics, as in the last six months. 20% of cybersecurity executives and pros wouldn't bet a chocolate bar on their cybersecurity. <laughs> 92% of CISOs and C-level execs are placing confident in their organization's security. I might take odds with that one. I don't think anybody's stupid in that particular set of consequences. But the impact of what that means is different. Not every CISO has come up through the ranks. There are a lot more requirements for a business to have a CISO. There are a lot more requirements for, I need to understand how a security program works. And if you're just getting out of school today, and you're going into the job market, we'll talk about that in a minute. But cybersecurity is getting real. By reference to what it was like first getting into the industry and, you know, 
having the amazing honor to be in touch with people that invented stuff. Today, those people aren't doing things anymore. They're all tired. The number of people that understand this problem has gone down. The number of executives who are no longer truly accountable for the things has gone up. And if we think that all is grim, it's at least helpful to know that, you know, 90, 96% of the CISOs know that. You can grow shame about whether that's a good or a bad thing, but there's a bunch of articles out about this that talk about President's Council of Advisors, right, starting to think about cyber-physical, right? There is government influence now being spread here because of some of these concerns and gaps, not just in the company's ability to honor a cyber-resiliency model, but also in their ability to execute that. Here's kind of the way I think about it. Um, you know, add, add some seasoning here. Your mileage may vary. Got it. Got it. I do refine this for every place that I go, but these are some pretty high level sort of things that we talk about from a metrics and a policy perspective that help me shape the board's opinion. And I do a couple of things here that are becoming very common practice. Okay? I don't like to surprise the board. It's bad for me, it's bad for them. Nobody went there. I like to let them know, hey guys, there's an email. Let me tell you about what's happening. Here's how we're prepared for this. Here's what we're doing. Because again, how many of those guys have cyber experience in the Force 500? Right? 12%. The board audit chair maybe has written code sometime in their career, probably not. And this is the storyline that we have to work with. So these are just some general. Some of these are Pareto metrics, some of these are legitimate. And you know, some of the things that are really critical about this is, you know, if you, if you show up in my shop, this is what I'm going to try to make sure the company understands clearly. And also board directors. Now, I'd like you to take note here. Secure by design, protect the brand, protect the workforce. What's missing? <laughs> Always. Two of these pictures are AI generated, as you might imagine. Two of these are closer to real. One of them's probably close to real for real. <laughs> <laughs> What's missing is, you know, technology, check. Process, frameworks, check. People, shit. Forgot about that. What do we do there? The company's getting compromised. And everything's kind of an incident, right? At some level, right? Whether or not it's an incident. It's new guys, right? Hey, look, uh, I've lost an eye, I've got scars. Like, we're good. Don't worry about it. Go back to your company hole and, you know, be a QB and be whatever. But we're good. We have this. No real sweat here. But at the same time, there's a number of other things that whether you've been in this industry for 20 years or two that are now pretty revolutionary, right? And we're just, we don't, yes, I know there's a new OSP standard for AI, okay? But that's great. Putting that into practice, so far away from that being reality, right? It's a conversation for cyber insurers right now. We're nowhere close to, yeah, you know what? Let me practically apply a bunch of stuff. You write policy. I don't know how you're going to audit it. Budgets get cut. We pile on to the folks we have, right? They're talented. This is a daily, well, this isn't really a daily thing. I mean, if you've seen this before, probably not. Um, this is actually a military parade in India, but um, I just love this picture. Because look at the choreographing that has to happen here, the balance, okay? I'd love to think that if my team 
or teams had a spirit animal, they'd be these guys. <laughs> <laughs> You gotta figure out how to do more with less today. Budget cuts. People leave the company. No backfills. Right? We can't do that right now. Really? We can't do that right now. <laughs> Let's go back to business as usual. What if not bringing those folks into my neighborhood impacts our business as usual? Right? This is the conversation. It's a regular conversation. Zombie guy knows it. He does it all the time. Okay. A lot of people have talked about the values. Okay. I'm working from home. I love it. I have a problem. It's called OCD. And so that's why, I mean, some people joke, hey, look, Fred, you've been a 10 star. Yes. Now I have one because I can't contend with anyone else's OCD, so it's mine. <laughs> but the trades you make for the business, the trades you make for your families to provide, right, cause a lot of uncertainty. And there is no rest for the wicked. When you respond to an incident, when you go through the process of dealing with the breach, that is exhausting. It is emotionally exhausting. 50% of employees told 1,000 people and 500 different companies have said, and that's not giant, but look, statistically speaking, if 50% of the employees said that if they found out their company had a breach, they'd look for employment elsewhere, now you've got that on your shoulders. Right? Your friends, your commiserators, right? Your cohibes, guys in the foxhole with you, they're not all security people. Security guys probably are not. Like, We've got five of those things you can. You guys don't worry about it. It's fine. But they're in bass. Okay? I get security to study on incident responders. And I realize I am spending a lot of time on incident response, but irrespective of the maturity of the company, it has an awful lot to do with staffing decisions. It has an awful lot to do with your business culture, about how security is portrayed by the education level, training. It does well down to this frequently, right? Look over here on the far left. So something we don't talk about a lot, there's residual damage done when you do stuff like this. That stress adds up. And it comes out in various ways depending on who you are. I encourage you guys to go take two books that sort of do some self analysis for you. Be probably very common Strengths Finder and Emotional Intelligence. You got it. Okay. Everybody should understand where they sit in the atmosphere. Because when it all comes down to it, all of your plans, all of your strategy, your frameworks, it comes down to the security team at some level, right? We might think so. It's not always true, but we might operate that way. And that leads to, right, some of the people that do this job. Mission driven, you have purpose, you want to make a difference, you want to make an impact, is any of that stuff familiar? <coughs> You believe in doing something right. You want to make the world a better place. You might want to secure things. You want to be the top person in your trade craft. You want to inspire others. A lot of these are terrific and aspirational. And the business probably doesn't care. Sorry. We'll talk about them later. But you got a plan here. There's a lot of outside influences. Okay, I'm not weighing on the on the politics of any of this. This is these are facts. So there's nothing to argue or debate about, right? A lot of stuff happening in the United States right now. A lot of effects uh, globally as a result of what we do here. A ripple effect. We may be witnessing something that is 
transformative for the first time in America's history. We may be witnessing that, right? You can't be immune to how that feels. Streaming in the void? I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I'm 50. I, I could run for president. Somebody, please. <laughs> <laughs> the average person today and their ability to exist above the poverty line, we have military personnel that use food stamps today in this economy. In this country, we have millions of EVs we cannot fully operationalize. And we have gas prices we don't control, even though today we produce more gas than in the history of the United States. I don't know about you guys, but I live in Seattle. Gas there for me, when it gets to $6 a gallon, I feel like I need to move. More on that later. Seattle did have the highest gas price in the United States at one point in time this last year. I make sure I tell people that. It's important. <laughs> but aside from this geopolitical turmoil, right, these national elections, uh, you know, shenanigans that are happening here, and who's going to try for what things and whatever, you also know that there is unrest in the rest of the world. You know, when America looks away, <coughs> things happen. Things are happening. What happens next, right? I don't know about you guys, again, I'm talking about your personal cyber resiliency plan. I care about this stuff personally, right? There's a lot of veterans in here, a handful of veterans in here, thank you, thank you for your service. I still feel like I'm in the fight, but I'm not. So I have a time box, my experience with this information, to 15 minutes a day, or you will find me under my desk in the fetal position <laughs> with a mummy trying to figure out what to do next. There's a lot of internal influences that you can't control, but they affect our well being. Maybe not directly control. Yeah, but it's challenge of skills. Now, cyber smart people, you need to be the genius at AI too. Now, you need to understand how that affects the entire business, even though no one does. We're in experimentation and exploration stages. Yeah, I'd love to hear again, oh boss, so that's great. I had this debate yesterday on a, on a podcast that's, hey, cool, I'm super glad there's a framework, okay? Now tell me how you're gonna enforce it with you know the 10,000 employees that work remotely on their laptops, Okay, zero trust, blah, blah, blah. When all of a sudden I need something done quickly, somebody's like, I don't remember the class I need to put in here. You know, chat should be need, right? Make sure you know it. Right, come on. Fix this vulnerability. And all of a sudden, right, it's no longer a decision. It's not a policy you can enforce. That's the world we live in. Yet, there are standards. Again, who does it fall back on to figure out how to solve some of these problems? And it's early days. Some of you guys might not remember this movie, Groundhog Day. Okay? But I think about this all the time. Bill Murray says, don't drive angry. Groundhog's driving it. <laughs> if you feel like you've had this conversation with the leadership team multiple times, and it's still not happening for you, okay? You're having your own Groundhog Day. That's a regular thing. It's a well-understood thing. Think back to my question, how long do you want to be in this industry? How do you manage that? How do you influence that? Then there's the, hey, you know what? Yeah, working from home, that's awesome. I, I don't know how to turn it off. I hand an incident off to somebody. There's a critical thing that has to get done. Yeah, probably, you know, Cecil had one. I'm going to have that risk hang out for four days. I can do that Saturday morning. I don't know. I mean, it probably takes all day Saturday. I thought it was four hours. It actually turned be eight, whatever. Because I don't want to have that happen. It's also, by the way, my personal reputation. You see two CISOs up here, okay? Both of them are, one of them's a criminal, one of them's soon to be a criminal. Okay? Yeah, on the far right, 
you guys know, is for Sullivan, was the Uber, right, set this whole thing in motion. Joseph Lloyd, <laughs> he prosecuted some of these cases, like, as some of the first things that were done. Joe's a really smart guy. You got to hung out to drive. There's a lot of opinions on this, but the facts are, you got to hung out to drive. He probably could have made some different decisions. Had he known he was going to be personally liable for them, would he have made different ones? I guarantee you, the most actors of the world will blow that thing out because they don't want to get hammered like that. So these are some of the internal things that we also have to contend with in order for us to understand that. I like Sonia. By the way, Jim Carrey. I mean, look, what a comeback. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was fortunate enough to get to work with a guy that was uh, what I would consider maybe the best CEO I've ever spent time with. And he happened to be the CEO of Swamp. And yeah, Swamp's a great company and all that at that time, in that place. But I got to spend a regular amount of time with Godfrey Sullivan, uh, how I wound up starting security and security practice, all that stuff at X1. We'll save for another off the table conversation later, Chatham House Rules. But Godfrey would never have a meeting if he was exhausted. Never. Why is that? Well, the CEO can't have a down day, can't have a down meeting, can't. So he can't be that dumb swell that's up, you know, 48 hours in an incident, right? That probably didn't work. So imagine that you parlay that out to the CISO. Imagine you parlay that out to maybe some other folks that are involved in that. And you think about, are they getting enough sleep? Do they make good decisions? Doom scrolling on what's happening in Telegram for, you know, what's happening in, in Israel and Gaza, right? I want to know what's happening. Except then I find out and I go into the field position. The job doesn't change. So every day I'm going to get up and do the same thing. What do I do? Well, today was hard. So I got up and I hammered back an energy drink. Or I drank another pot of coffee. Sounds good. Not sustainable. Not for 20 years. Punching holes in walls? There's a limited amount of wall space. <laughs> <laughs> Journal about it. I, I've never been able to do it, but some people have found a way that this actually helps them. A couple of years ago, I got a career coach, and again, some of this feedback for you guys is from doing this for a long time. I came up through the ranks. I'm a practitioner by trade. If anybody ever calls me out, and says, "Oh well, you, know, you didn't, you haven't," blah 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 blah. Nope, and I still do. So go back to wherever you were. It's the thing that helps you understand how to make what you do palatable to others, okay, for 20 years. How many guys, girls, people do you run into that are crunchy, jaded, cynical, prickly? They might have heard it, but that doesn't matter. Some of that's because we don't take care of the basics. And some of that's up to you. In fact, I'm going to say the first two are absolutely up to you. If you think about it, right, we started with there's all of this industry compliance. There's all of this data point around what the company is building for cyber resiliency. Then there's your responsibilities. Right, for your side of resilience, and we give you a couple of pointers here of things that I've picked up along the way that have helped me because I'm not prickly, but if you want to go to guns with me in an IR situation where you don't have the context that I do, I'm going to be less empathetic. Does that win overall down the road? Well, again, less is from the foxhole, right? Doesn't really work well that way. Try not to do it. Love and belonging, safety and security, physiological needs. Again, salt to taste here, okay? Physical fitness. 
I was doing a thing, uh, we built the cyber weapons platform for the Earth Force, where 192 bases, used to find bad guys, blah, blah, blah. In order to do that, I was literally working seven days a week, 18 to 20 hours a day. I put on 80 pounds. Yeah, unhealthy. I probably kept, like, you guys have heard of the rock. Okay, Dwayne Johnson, Zoba. Yeah, he owes me a part of the company. <laughs> <laughs> but also, what do you do? You you also take comfort in things that you probably ought not to. Maybe you eat, maybe you drink, maybe you don't talk about it, but you should. And so, to keep those things in mind, to be resilient means you are not constantly putting yourself in harm's way and at odds. It's not to say you should have a good time and, you know, don't drink. It is to say, think about what you do with some discipline and some rigor because you know you're going to do this for you and not think. And it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. And again, over a long period of time. Do you have a diaspora for you to talk to? Do you have a group of people? I mean, uh, Set KC is pretty cool. Do you have a group of people, whether it's at your company, across a bunch of companies, that you can really hammer this thing on and spend time? Get consensus. Talk your ideas. If you're crazy, talk amongst your friends. <laughs> do you want it? Do something you're not good at all the time. I'd love to tell you I'm an amazing guitar player. I started playing guitar so I could play Led Zeppelin catalog because I'm a Led Zeppelin freak. And I can mostly do that. Don't ask me to do a whole lot else. Okay, but I do that because it's challenging for me. My son's a far better guitarist than I am. Which, you know, good for him. It makes me a little angry, but you know what? <laughs> That's fine. <awesome. laughs> In the retirement home, I will be the best music guitarist there is. <laughs> this is important. There's a bunch of trade-offs that you make every day. You're in charge of those, for the most case. Okay? Your work-life balance, right? These sweet spots of figuring this out. People don't know your sweet spot. A great manager may figure it out later. Spend some time to figure out where you sit in this. There are polarities required for you to trade here. Keep those in mind. Is anybody familiar with the ladder of inference? Here's how we make decisions. We do this every day. This is how we decide what it is that we do. And inherently, we have a thing called cognitive bias. Okay? I don't have time to spin through the ladder of inference for you, but here's what I'll tell you in brief summation that you should spend time on yourself. Your cognitive bias may affect your lateral of interest, where you start and where you end up. And so what does that mean? Self-reflection on whether or not you really have the right outcomes from the decision you made, great. Here's an example. I don't like wasting food. So, or I don't like going to movies, paying for a movie, the movie sucks. You know, I mean, Netflix is really to improve. Okay, but... Got an Netflix good wall, we paid, you know, six ninety nine for it. We're going to watch this. I don't care if it sucks and if it's better than Jennifer Spotty, great. <laughs> you could just turn it off. Right? Your decision tree should be regularly evaluated. Don't get comfortable and say that your decision-making process is what it needs to be forever. Retrain yourselves. Part of your side of the I see. Part of your love to everything you have What happens when you don't? <laughs> the time of being a rock star without having EQ is gone. Gone. As a CISO, as a security professional, part of your sound resilience is longevity. Don't give it away. Emotional intelligence to that Go check it out. Read up on emotional intelligence. Dana Bowen is a brilliant dude, and I think from a psychologist that's popularized this notion of how this works. Self-regulation, okay? Help understand how you manage your emotions. How many of you have a, I'm going to go a couple minutes over, sorry. We went a couple minutes late, so we're going a couple minutes late. We'll be guys. 
you need one more minute. When you get into a situation where you're having a conversation, it escalates. How do you de-escalate that? How many of you have a big red button in your chest that says, hit me, no ass, if you want to talk about something that really, really makes you emotionally upset? Well, don't give it away. It's yours. Maintain control of yourself. Do that by pausing. Do that by taking a step back. Do that by recognizing, hey, you know what? Like, I don't need to have this conversation right now. This is an inner talk track. Just walk out of the room. Come back later. Personal resiliency. Why are you guys here? Besides the school, there's stuff to do. There's workshops, training, presentations, memes, all the things. I come back to that diaspora question. Find somebody today that hasn't been in cybersecurity for 20 years and spend some time with them. Not just today. Mentorship is not an hour, right? It's a you. That person will make you better, Mr. I've been in the industry far too long. And as a person coming into the industry, understanding the context you enter so that you are equipped with the skills necessary to win. Find somebody that you don't normally get to spend time with. I mean, I'm blessed because I don't get to see you guys very often. I haven't been here five years. So it's like easier. Find somebody else that needs help. Right? The community here is really strong. I mean that. Super cool that people will and do reach out. But spend the time while you're here, while you're in these sessions, while you're at a CTF, the after party. I know R said it's 420, right? So, I mean, do what you do. <laughs> Find a friend. Figure out how you can help someone else achieve those steps and Maslow's means that you have. Figure out how to establish a way for you to be a contributor and a participant in a place where you might feel prickly. You might have some of that residual stress. <laughs> and some of that will help people's self-esteem. Some of that will help you become the person you want to be, not just the cyborg person you want to be. With that, I'd love for you guys to have a great day today. So I'd love for you to embrace KCB side for what it is. Please visit our sponsors. And if you would like to get in touch and you need something from me, please reach out. Thank you.